Am I the only one excited about this episode? No, I'm excited too. I'm, well, I, I don't know. We've had such a good time uh, doing this podcast and the ups and the downs and everything. And, and you know, I, I, I really enjoy when we bring in another couple, especially a couple that that we're close with, are friends with, or do business with, or are, are we want to know more yeah. about, right? So yeah. uh, as you can see, we have four microphones out and four chairs, and we have a very special guest um, couple to introduce you guys to. But first, I don't want to leave out um, Miami. Yeah, and our sponsors. And your birthday weekend. And our sponsors. That I feel like, I mean, how many fucking cakes... <laughs> Are we going to eat? I tasted oh so many God. cakes and donuts. The club got you a cake. Sweet bread. Stu from Pick Cherries got you. Amazing donuts. Donuts. Yes. Mom had cake. We had cake before we left. I mean, uh, can we stop? I had at ice what cream point, cake. I had strawberry cake. I had strawberry. Uh, at what point can we stop celebrating your birthday? We're done. Okay. I'm done. Thank God. Too much birthday. Thank like God. the Bernstein Bears book. Too much birthday. Oh, a lot of birthday going on. But... You know, we love, 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 love going to Miami. Yes. And Miami just has a certain culture and flavor to it that, that is unlike, I think, anywhere else in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's definitely, they have their own accents. They, oh my gosh, they speak know, Spanish so fast. They speak Spanish very fast. So fast. Um, but but the, the love we get in Miami is just amazing. And, and, you know, I, I would say, and you, and you feel the energy in the club. Oh my gosh. You know, yes. The audiences in Miami. I think we said this last time we were there too. They're just, like you said, so much energy and so lively. There's a buzz of excitement and yes. they're, they're happy to be out. And then you can just tell that Miami people uh, and South Florida people, because there was people from all over South Florida, yeah. but th they have a lust for life. Is that the right word? Well, I was going to say that it, the words I were going to use were larger than life. It's like a larger than life attitude. And and I think that that's part, I, I always tell you, like last time we were there, uh, you know, that's part of the reason I think we do so well in Miami is because they have a very uh, uh, fuck it attitude and a, and a, a, a very fun kind of feeling to... And I'm very honest, like they're not, they're, they're like New Yorkers kind of the fact uh -huh. that, that they don't, they don't beat around the bush. Yeah. You know, you're not going to hurt their feelings, right? They're, they're just, and I just, I loved it. And, and what's really cool. And I don't think we've ever talked about, um, Justin and Melissa before, but when I started, uh, a million years ago, going to the Miami improv, which uh -huh. was in coconut Grove, um, Justin was working there. Um, I think he was a door guy and Melissa was a server. Really? Yep. And then all the, you know, I met them there and they, you know, I was an opening act. They were, they were waiting tables and, and kind of doing their thing, uh -huh. but they weren't a thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, Justin becomes manager, Melissa becomes manager. And I'm like, uh -huh. and then Justin all of a sudden's like, well, you know, I'm with Melissa now. And I'm like, what? Right. So they, they ended up getting married and now they run. Um, this Miami improv together. And it's just so cool. And when I first met to, them with you, I didn't know they were a couple because at work, they're like, oh no, at work, they're, they're totally definitely, pro at work. You yeah. wouldn't, if you just walked into that situation, you wouldn't know it. And for the longest time, yeah. I didn't know I until. Couldn't, I couldn't work with you. I would grab your ass every time you walked by <laughs> and HR would be on my ass. Right? No, but I think I'd already been with you like once or twice. And then I, I, we were there and we were out afterwards and we were like, y'all come out. And then it was after the fact when they came out, I was like, oh, they're together. Yeah. Like totally over my head. Didn't know it. And, and we just love them. And, and, and that's what's been really cool on this journey and this, this path that me and you have been on together is that is that all these couples have come into our lives. And, and Corey yeah. and Megan, who's going to be on the podcast tonight, are, are, are some of those people that I met Corey without you. And, and I've known Corey for, a, gosh, forever now, it seems. Uh -huh. um, and now we're, we're getting to know his wife and his kids and, you know, yeah. all that good stuff. So um, I just want to throw a shout out to Miami. And I, I hate that. I mean, we literally, guys, it is Monday right now. We got off the plane. We drove straight here. And we met Corey and Megan and we had lunch and now we're sitting down podcasting. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't able to. I got another beautiful challenge <gasps> coin. Oh, I saw it because as yep. soon as we came in, I threw this stuff in the laundry. It's from... Oh, you have it. I, I think so. You want me to go get it? Yes. Will you go get okay. it? I'll do the sponsors. Yes. yes. Okay. 
Um, but don't forget, guys, please, we could not do this podcast without our friends at Aztec Chevrolet. Please give them an opportunity. I cannot say enough good things about those people. And nowadays, to find a dealership that is still locally owned and operated is a really special thing. Aztec Chevrolet, give those guys a chance. They've got, actually, there's a truck coming in right now with, I happen to know, a brand new 2023 high country Tahoe. So um, check that out. And then, of course, our friends at Old Salt Coffee. Remember, if you're going to drink coffee, buy it from a veteran-owned company, veteran-owned and operated. And every bag of coffee that you buy with the code Trevino10, you give a dollar back to our veteran. That might be the most calm you've ever done one. And pick cherries, of course. (laughs) Download pick cherries. Listen to every podcast practically ad-free. It is so organized for you and easy to use. You will podcast like never before. And um, so here it is. Yeah. Isn't this one amazing? I thought that one was really cool. This is from the Hialeah Police, established in 1972. Wow. Honor, pride, determination. And it's just a beautiful coin. And I, I mean, I, guys, I cherish these and I, I take care of them. And, and oh my gosh, I don't even see the back. How cool is that that's awesome look at that this one's huge it's a cool coin oh uh, we love you hialeah police man please 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 stay safe out there and and thank you for doing your job and and also to the the spouses of police officers thank you for your sacrifice because i know that you truly truly worry um about your loved one when they go out there on patrol so i'm gonna put it in my collection right now do we have room? I have room. I'm going to need a bigger case soon. I'm going to need a bigger case. Um, but it, I, Miami is so much fun. And, and we went as a family because um, um, it was your birthday. And then yes. we, we brought mom, Miss Dora, because it's her birthday in a couple of days. Yes. That was another cake we had. We had two cakes <laughs> with Miss Dora. Like, holy crap. We probably had five, six different cakes in the past three days yeah. for my mom. And then mom got to come on stage, which was awesome. And Delilah for the People first People love time. it when your mom goes on oh, stage. Man, dude, she's, she's so, so funny. funny. And we laughed and we, we, we were, we were having such a good time with, with, uh, mom and having her on stage and, and when she laughs then you laugh and she's just got a great uh, yes she does have a good laugh um and then delilah so in the green room the, there's like a staircase and delilah loves going up and down stairs and then she realized oh there's another door where does this door go to and it was the door to the stage and it had a big old lock on it she was like trying to figure out she how she to, was gonna get out there and that's how garrett was at that age remember garrett was like i want to be on stage why can't i be on stage yeah uh, so i was able to walk delilah out on stage and and um, I mean, to a packed crowd, there were like 400 people in that room. 400 people, yeah. It was it was awesome, man. And and for me, you know, to really really make it a family affair, you know, I, I think I, I don't think there's any comedians that treat the stage and their career the way that we do. Yeah. You know, we are all involved. We are all all part of the show and the circus. And you know, Garrett sang "God Bless the USA," which was. I mean, I would, I'm would. i on stage just full of pride, and I'm watching. I mean, people are, like, crying. Oh, but the, you know? again, it was like that was a Miami crowd experience. I don't know that he will have that experience any place else where, like, they're singing with him, they're standing. They awesome. started, like, waving their arms back and forth, so then Delilah's watching, and she's got her arms up in the air. It was really cute. Really special weekend, and, and Miami, just thank you for the continued love and support. And uh, without further ado, is that how you do it? Ado? Ado. Is that how you do it? Yes. I don't know if that's how you do it. Um, I, I mean, I can't wait for you guys to meet um, our, our friends. And, and there's going to be a, a couple of things I want to kind of let you guys in on. Um, not only is Corey a very good friend of mine, um, Corey has become uh, somewhat of a spiritual leader with all of our, our friends. Um, but he also, Corey has also handled um, our finances. He has handled our life insurance policies. Um, he has moved on from being a Dallas Cowboy, where he was on the offensive line, where uh, Tony Romo would touch his ball sack <laughs> because he was the center. Um, I'm sure that's how he loves being introduced. And, uh, Good job, Steve Trevino. I just can't imagine uh, uh, Tony Romo just <laughs> touching my balls and my taint. 
every play. Okay. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, but what's really interesting. Say something else nice about him. So well, that's no, not the way what, we introduce what, them. No, what's really interesting is that, you know, I want to get into his life with Megan and, and how they met. Yeah. Uh, here in the beginning. And then I, and then I want to get kind of Megan's perspective as to, you know, we know what it's like to be married to a comedian. Right. We met Marky. We know what it's like to be married to a professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. We met um, Sarah McCutcheon, who knows what it's like to be married to a professional baseball player. Yeah. We met Chelsea Rogers, who knows what it's like to be married to um, a a country touring star. Yeah. Um, But I don't think we've met an NFL wife. But it's funny because it is like a different and unique experience. But then it's just like, it's like your stand-up too. We all relate to the same things in a marriage, you know? No, you definitely relate to the same things as a marriage. But, you know, you always wonder. You go, man, number one, as, as, a, as a man, mm-hmm. and, and we talked about this with baseball, that's a dream job, right? To play in the NFL, every kid, even me who's five foot five, I'm like, one day I'm going to be in the, uh, the NFL, <laughs> right? Um, so just to kind of wonder what that, what that life is like, what that world is like. And, 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 you know, also, uh, um, Corey is an offense, uh, an ex offensive lineman. So he's huge. Yeah. So it's like the day, the guy at the airport today, everybody was staring at him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now Corey's a big guy. This guy was probably seven foot. He's got to be so, all I kept thinking about was like, he's got to be so uncomfortable on a plane. Even if he, he has to buy a first class ticket one, cause I There's don't no think he could have fit in a yeah. regular seat, but even in a huge. first class seat, I feel like his knees are still probably up in his chest. He's huge. Uh, so without further ado, <laughs> speaking of huge motherfuckers, um, I would like to introduce my friend Corey and his beautiful wife, Megan. Megan Come on in, guys. the Proctor. Yes. The Proctors. Come on in guys. He's a gentleman. He's gonna let he's gonna let Megan come in first. Come on. Uh, well, first of all, guys, we have been we have been talking about getting you guys on the podcast for, for a long time, forever. Yes. It's um, scheduling. So he has not he has not left Dallas because, well, you know, when you play for the Dallas Cowboys, that's where you live. You stay there. Now. You stay there. Yeah. It's, um, um, I'm not going to give that up. So we've been trying to figure it out. And, and, and even, thing, you know, yeah. when it comes to business stuff, I mean, Corey and I should be talking more and, and we just don't have the time, you know, but I want to get into, um, first of all, how did this happen? <laughs> what, what part of this? <laughs> this magic? You mean this magic? Yeah, this, this magic. Show? Who, who hit on who? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That was a long time ago. Um, well, we did a, a chubby bunny contest mm, one time. Right. What is a oh, chubby, oh, bunny contest? chubby bunny contest? I don't you know, know what, what that, that is. Oh, you Re- get yourself a man, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's, He's like, You want to see my chubby yeah. bunny? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're uh, we got introduced through Marco Rivera, who was on the team at the time. And uh, and he doesn't like it when you call him Mexican because he's Puerto Rican. So <laughs> if you see him, make yeah, that Latinos mistake, have like a hierarchy of like. <laughs> Who thinks they're better? You know, Puerto Ricans. Everybody thinks the Mexicans. We're the worst. We're on the bottom <laughs> of the list. Um, but but continue. I'm sorry. No. So we, he introduced us, and it was a Green Bay because she's from Green Bay. Whole family came down uh, for a Green Bay Dallas game one time. Oh, us. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me slow down here. A Green Bay fan daughter mm-hmm. married a Dallas I Cowboy. Know, I know. That had to go it's like off. sacrilege, right? That I had know. to go off like a turd in a punch bowl. Yeah. Right. I know. I, I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't. We didn't really. So uh, I never had to pick a side. But you, so you oh, guys, you were inside. already, you were already playing ball when you guys met no. yes. for the Cowboys. Yeah, I was playing. She was funny. She swore off football players, mm-hmm. and I basically swore off women at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was like the fact that we came together was a big but deal. But you know what? It's yeah. funny. Don't you hear that a lot? Don't you hear that a lot? Where where. You know, they always say like, if you're, if you, when you're looking, you don't find. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And people go, oh, I was done dating, and blah, and then all of a sudden, this guy came into my life or whatever. Don't you feel like you hear that a lot? Or, yeah. Or like, you know. So you were definitely not. But how did you know Marco? I nannied, essentially, babysitting nanny. You whatever. stole the nanny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I had kind of moved on. I mean, I, I mean, she I was, could take care of me. That's what. So uh, I'm so <laughs> confused. So what brought you to Dallas? Um, so Marco had been playing in Green Bay and then when he got signed in Dallas, uh, they had three boys and 
Um, you know, I mean, I think I'm pretty, you know, very choosy with who I let watch my kid, like any person, right? Yeah. Like I'm sure y'all are. And, um, they didn't know anybody. So they had the three boys, you know, when you're, uh, resigned in a new, um, location, it, I think in any sport, you just go. Mm-hmm. So they didn't know anybody to watch their boys. And they had asked me, we, we were actually supposed to go to Puerto Rico over spring break that year. And we had to, um, Michelle actually called me and she said, Hey, change of plans. We're actually going to Dallas instead. So I flew down and I would nanny for a while then. And then over time, you know, I would go less and less as they started meeting people and, you know, get more sitters that were local. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, but we're we still friends. So I would, you know, fly down there and Marco was still playing and Corey was on the practice squad. And oh, we're not on practice squad here. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's be clear. Let's, let's be Let's clear be about clear. that. They picked me up off the practice squad in Detroit. I'm sorry. On the team <laughs> on here. The, to be clear. He was not on the practice squad <sighs> when I met him. So, so <laughs> I, I find it really cool that, that, so you, not only were you their nanny, you started becoming friends with them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean... They, that, they're great. They're natural, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how we treat people that work with us. I mean, we're, oh, for sure. we're we treat them like family, and they become family. Mm-hmm. And you know, Miss Betty's no longer with us anymore as an employee, but dude, she comes over like all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's like, I'm on my way. You know. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, sure. You know. So then you come in. Then now let's get to the chubby bunny. Oh, so that's when we were at a um, campground. They had had like a Thursday night game. So well, you know, during the season, it's not often where you get weekend time because that's. You know, that's either getting time. ready for a football game or is that, right. that's a game day, right? Yeah. yeah. So that happened to be, I want to say it was a Thursday or Friday night game. Yeah. Because then it was like a Friday or Saturday. We were all out at the campground. Glamping. Um, yeah. Glamping. Marco had this giant bus, he called it. It was really like a really nice. I was going to say, you in a tent sounds really comical. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. No. We were, really, we were just there. And then, you know, well, we were we were not together. So, you know, we just came to hang out. And actually, we were drinking drinking the leftover beer from the tailgate. That's what we were doing. <laughs> and then... Um, uh, we were we did our little chubby bunny thing. So we had a bunch of marshmallows for s'mores, and you try to stuff as many in your mouth as you can, and whoever gets the most. Wins. And you saw her put a lot of stuff in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, Corey's like she can handle me. The problem. I've got wider. Oh, <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. I mean, sorry, don't set us up. I mean, that's what it was. The problem. So was that's was what the, chubby bunny is. That's chubby yeah. bunny is. Yeah. But How many were, marshmallows can you stuff in your mouth? But we didn't count. We were like, oh, we're gonna count them on our on when we spit them out. You know. <laughs> But they all mush they together. They all get all like nasty and it sounds like drunk and nasty. Oh yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah, and now exactly. here we are. Yeah. So so that. But I was so, like in that chubbiness. I was like, <laughs> she's the one. She's the one. Yeah. And so I knew it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But did, did did you have a moment of that's my girl? There was answer carefully. No, not like there wasn't. I can't say there was a specific moment. Probably when like it like when our relationship hit a bad point or like a choosing point. Basically I knew she was a game changer. Um, when you wanted to change. Absolutely. Right. right? So like, that's where I kind of swore off women. Cause like the relationship I had before that was broke off really bad. And I was like, screw that. And so I was kind of a jerk to the ladies and we had met, started doing this long distance thing, seeing each other, at a couple different events, really liked each other, started dating a little bit and, and tried to do this. And, I, and so like that, at segue in, I knew she was different, right? And uh, it wasn't like, hey, there's this hot chick and I just want to jump on her. And she she made me laugh, all those good things. And then as we got into it, there was times just like any relationship, right? Where like you guys, somebody cut somebody and and I was the one who did that. And, and she had basically threatened to leave. And I'm like, I don't, I already knew she was game changer. I was like, no yeah. problem. If I'm I'll less of an everything. asshole, if I'm less of an asshole, will you <laughs> stay? <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, that, and that's how it was for me and Renee, where where you do feel that that is the game changer where you go, oh, I don't want her to leave. Right. All the others, I'd be like. I think that's such a male mentality. Like when I heard Corey explain it, I was like, yeah, that's definitely the way Steve thinks. But I think that's such a guy's way of thinking. I don't think of it that way. Do you? Of the game changer? Yeah. Or you do? Um, I'm not choose I don't know advice. I don't really yeah. I, it's hard for me to really conceptualize how he views it because obviously I don't see it that way you know? that's what she's yeah. asking how yeah. do you see it yeah. uh, the whole like, how did you know that he was like right, I don't know is... I want to keep you until I've pissed you off and the threat of you leaving is real <laughs> oh, I don't know <laughs> that's basically what they're saying yes yeah. I mean I yeah because I've never not that I know of I mean I've 
I pissed him off. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> never, never to the point, um, you know, that kind of thing. But that was before we were engaged and everything. So, you know, that was more just me setting a boundary. Corey and I are big yeah. believers yeah. in, you know, you essentially teach people how to treat you, right? With right. what you don't consider. Um, okay. Yeah. Where you accept exactly. or you don't exactly. allow. Yeah. Right? yeah. So right. that was just me, um, you know, telling him, essentially, conveying what I would not tolerate. And then, you know, what his response to that was, was his response. I couldn't control what he did. So. Yeah. Well, what are your, what, what were your parents like? How did they feel about Corey in the beginning? <laughs> oh, my mom <laughs> actually is the <laughs> that one. That mom was good. She, she was like, oh, it's funny. <laughs> It's funny because my mom's the one who introduced me to him, you know, and she was like, oh man, I met this guy. I think you're really going to like him, you know, this and that. And then we started dating and I don't think dating was actually her intent. I thought she no, just thought we would like be friends <laughs> yeah. and we would like get along and, you know, be have a funny banter and that would be it. And then, you know, we're married. <laughs> here we are. So here we are. So, I mean, they like him. I, I know that they, they love that he and I um, have a really good you know, team mentality. We think of each other as a team and I think that they appreciate our togetherness, but sometimes don't get me wrong, that togetherness is not always appreciated. So you know, I was the, um, in the beginning he was playing for the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. I mean, life had to be a million miles an hour back then. Yeah. Well, and you know, what's funny is we, it was, it, I mean, it was, so I was in law school, he was playing football. We we're just mm -hmm. busy, busy. And then he ended up getting cut and then got signed with the Dolphins. And I was able to... That's um, where players go to die. Mm -hmm. yeah. if you, did, if you didn't know. Yeah. One last hurrah. <laughs> yeah. Go have one That's last right. hurrah. You yeah. and Colombo. Y'all yeah. get on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally. And um, so we went there and I was able to kind of finagle my law school. So it was basically like I was studying abroad for my last semester. So I was able to essentially go with him, right? Which was great. And ended up being even more of a um, blessing because he ended up getting hurt. So I don't know how that would have transpired over those last two months, yeah. you know, if if somebody wasn't there for him. Um, where was I going with that? I totally forgot what, what we were... Just the chaos. There's so the chaos of traveling you know, the and his career, the early... Yeah, well, oh yeah, we were just... Um, we were engaged in when he was in Miami and then came back and got married. That's why he got engaged because he's like, look... I'm going to be very less attractive. <laughs> After I'm no yeah. longer an NFL player, I better lock this shit up now. Get that real soon. Oh yeah. my gosh. No. And then, you know, it's funny because then we got married and that's when, I mean, obviously you transition from being a single person. I was in, in school uh, under my parents, everything, right? So yeah. more of like a kid and then kind of transition over to being a wife. And then that whole first year. It's my wife. Um, that whole first year he was injured. Well, really, I mean, it was, yeah, two years. Oh, and it was crazy. Uh, but y'all were living in Miami. No. So we, I oh, heard back. Miami moved back to Dallas and to that's rehab. where basically I had all my surgeries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So rehab there, but I had Found an infection out. that came in my knee yeah. from the surgery and which was gross. Cause it literally like blew up overnight, oh. like in bed. It was like, she, like, like, it like actually like a like shot. I shot fluid. out. It was disgusting. <laughs> and it like threw her off the other side of the bed. <laughs> and you're like, this woman's going to marry me. I, I was laughing. We were already married at that point. So yeah. you're she's staying. Yeah. Yeah. When the infection Damn. came, that was, oh yeah. Yeah. So that whole first year, you know, that was, he got hurt in <laughs> November. Do you have your law degree at this point? Yes. So I, I mean, at that point. At that point, yeah. So you yeah, had already graduated. She had to study for the bar and stuff. Yeah, I fit, so he was in Miami for the fall. Got hurt in November. Um, moved. <laughs> oh, that last month was awful. Remember that? That's horrible. Um, that last month, so I was studying for my finals, my final finals, right, with law school at a different school. Um, he was hurt, had had surgery, but you know he's in a straight brace, so his leg is locked out. He needed help going to go Doing shower everything. every third day. Yeah. It was awful. You're like wash it. Yeah. Yeah. They, oh my gosh, it was horrible. You and, smell that. Uh, I mean, I was, you know, what I was. Anyway, and then so that last, um, this was like the very first week of December. We're packing up our apartment to move back to Dallas because we didn't want to live in Miami. Um, I'm trying to take finals for law school. He's hurt. We have two dogs that we don't have a backyard, so I have to walk them every couple hours. We're packing. And Nothing then my baby. grandpa died. Oh. And my school wouldn't let me take finals early, so I had to stay long enough. And then we had amazing friends. Thank goodness. Yeah. Actually, Marco was one of them. Yeah. So I packed everything up, loaded up my car. They drove 
Corey's truck back with my car and a little U-Haul From Miami? Trailer. Yeah. yeah. Hurt. Yeah. Hurt. Yeah. I was laying in the back seat. Yeah. I'm telling you, we have amazing, Blasting Kesha, amazing friends. Blasting Kesha, trying to stay awake all night long. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> Incredible friends. So they brought him back, and I flew up to Wisconsin to go to my grandpa's funeral, met him back in Dallas, and then we started the whole rehab thing rehab journey me driving him around in his big lifted f-250 people looking at me like i was nuts yeah. like it was my she drove it everywhere because i didn't know yeah so yeah. At, that, at that point are you thinking i'm done with the nfl no are, are you thinking i'm gonna get better i'm gonna get back in the game totally thought you were coming back the mm-hmm. whole time right and so that that was just it you're like okay well what's the step what's the next thing to get back yeah. and it was all right in fact it was it was repair the knee then it got infected, it wasn't getting any better, and then I was on two bouts of uh, antibiotics where I had a pick line we in my arm, line. right? When we got and married, during our wedding, we actually had to have him go back to the back room. He couldn't drink at our own wedding. He had a yeah. pick line in his arm, central. Holy um, shit. I looked sick at mm-hmm. my, yeah. yeah. Holy cow. Like, like it, I lost a ton of weight, so my, my tux was super loose. Everybody mm-hmm. looked good. Because the wedding was like, on, right? Yeah. I mean, we were doing oh, the wedding. Yeah. We're not yeah. stopping. I started walking the week of the wedding. Mm-hmm. Without crutches, without yeah. a crutch, right? No, walking, period. Oh, it's yeah. all a blur. So like, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, God. So, a lot of drinks since then. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we had Holy. that. So if you go back and look at our videos and our pictures, I look like this pale. Yeah. But, as uh, but if I'm not pale enough. At that it point, is. is Miami saying, you're still on the team, just oh, get no. better? Oh, no. no. Oh, no, it's no. like, hey, you're not even on injured reserve. I was on a one-year deal. <clears throat> and this is typical. So they, this happens to a lot of guys, especially if you're on one-year deals. But they wanted to rush me back. This was, I got hurt on a, a Thanksgiving game against Chicago. Um, or no, no, excuse no, me, Thursday, the week before Thanksgiving yeah. on a Thursday night game. And so Thanksgiving was taking place. So everybody was on vacation and Doc couldn't get me in. So I had, a, you know, like 10 days before I had surgery. And Mind you, go, by the way, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do because this is important. Uh-huh. His patella, his kneecap actually broke, right? Which, like, by the way, and I don't mean to be a jerk to the NFL, but had you been a touchdown producing running back i don't think you would have waited 10 days to get a surgery oh no 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 you're in you would have been they would have been yeah uh, right you're just the lineman like uh another broken lineman yeah you know get a million well just the amount of swelling in his knee was like it was just incredible so he's like you know laid up on the couch right continue yeah it looked nasty and he's just kind of sitting around waiting for to be able to get Surgery. Yeah, ruptured my patella tendon and split the kneecap in half. Oh. So it swells up like a you know, like a watermelon on the field. So I passed out on the field when it happened. Worst pain I've ever had was when I woke up from that because then uh Kevin O'Neill, who was a trainer at the time, just slapped me in the head to wake up. And that when I finally woke up, oh! like, right? It's not concussion protocol to hit a guy in the head to yeah. wake him up anymore. After but, yeah. Uh, yeah. anymore, <laughs> anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I woke up and that's when this pain rushed into me and it was crazy. But my kneecap had come up into my quad oh. and it was nasty. And so, um, but yeah, they rushed to like, I need you to go back. I need to get this fixed. Come back. I think I had surgery like on a Tuesday. I need you to be back in by Friday. But the, No the, way. Yeah. Just to be physically there. Not to be, be like, there. you know, yeah. doing much, but to actually be there for their, to start PT. But yeah. I, I've always said that, that I fall more in love with my wife as, as time goes on because of all the things that we've been through. Right. Right. Was that a moment for you guys? That, you guys that, went that, through so much like right out the gate. That, that you, you, you oh, wow. as a man find that like, man, this woman is here for me. Like we, well, it was, you know, it's like how you respond in those times, right? That's what gives you respect for each other. And like it either, if it, even if it's you doing the cutting or it's somebody else, like how you respond in that, it brings the respect and love into it even more. And that's what builds on compounds on top of each other. So like even during that, you know, when that happened, she came, she like busted her ass like down behind all the security. <laughs> and like, as I'm being carted off on the field, she's down there, meets me down in the, in the, uh, big hallway. Right, but right, you, right outside the locker room, we like bawling. We were just engaged, and, so they didn't believe me. So yeah. <laughs> like, no. yeah. I'm like, where else do you see a Proctor jersey in this yeah. whole stadium? <laughs> Nobody. No, not one. <laughs> not one. Good luck. <laughs> Please, but there's one this, dipshit in the yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> like, that's not a real player. Yeah, that's not, <laughs> Um, but so, she but she busted down, right? And so, but like she, you know, and that was it. But we, I came in that Friday, ready to roll. And uh, Jeff Ireland, who was our GM at the time, he came to, he saw me on the PT table and he was just like, hey man, 
we're going to go ahead and let you go so you can go train where you want. And like made it sound like it was, you know, I'm going to let you do your thing. Yeah. Right. And like, at the time you're like, basically like, okay, coach. But, right? but, you, but you're, I mean, you're also still it. a kid. Right. You know, you're, you're still very, very young and you're like, yeah, sir. Like awesome. Exactly. Right. So I'm like, okay. And he leaves and I'm like, I just got cut. Right. He just I don't have go. a job. Right. When I'm supposed to be back with my family, training, rehabbing, doing all the things that I'm supposed to do. And so instead, they sent me to this PT place, like in the back of an Anytime Fitness, was about the size of this room with like two tables, and that's you know smelled awful. When and did um, was there ever a realization of like I might not be going back to the NFL? No. The whole time that. you're like I'm I'm coming back. So I'm calling my my agents and I'm like, we're going to get this done and we're going to be right back at it. How did you feel, Megan? Did you, did you feel like, hey, dummy, maybe it's time to... I'm, no, no. I was 100% on board for, I mean, for a long, long time. Um, but honestly, for the first two months of it, it, I was really distracted. You know, I had my own stuff and I had to finish my... I mean, why bother being in, in a whole different area and to let your semester's worth of work go over, you know, two weeks that you, you just got to get it done. Right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, I was very distracted and then I went from obviously taking care of him, but like little things that now I can look back at and they're so ridiculous, but just the fact that he had, you know, chills and fevers, chills and fevers. I had no idea that was a huge sign of an infection. infection. So I'm just trying to like manage, manage the time. So I would like, you know, I went, I remember going to Target across the street and buying Tylenol and popsicles. Like, like that's my shopping list. I'm going to make him feel better, but I didn't really fix anything. Like, how much Tylenol do you need? Lady? Oh my gosh. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, I'm really good at following instructions and rules and I like read it. You know, and so I was, I was totally taking care of him, but I wasn't really fixed. I mean, I wasn't really helping. That was, but helping. that wasn't like the purpose. Like I, th I look back on that and it was more like I was, I was in a bad place mentally when I was with the dolphins. I wasn't performing very well, the whole very time. much in my and head this is before the injury. Yeah. And, and so <clears throat> I think I can look back now, then I was pissed off. Right. But I can look back now and God is more like, Hey, I'm trying to create a husband because we're in gays and not a football player anymore. And so that's where you're talking about how we gain more appreciation as we go was she had to basically take care of me for the next year, year and a half. And, and, and just to be clear, and, and I know I make fun of you a lot, but I'm not making fun of you. How much were you, how much did you weigh at this point? When? When you were hurt and she was having to take care of you. Well. So you would have to help this yeah, monster of a man around. I'd lost a bunch point. of weight, so I'm sitting at 280, 275. Only? Yeah. Only. <laughs> yeah, but still, yeah, for yeah, her I mean, to try to push me around. Right. I didn't put, well, we, I brought well, the mattress. Remember, we brought the mattress. We, I brought the queen <laughs> mattress, mattress from upstairs in this apartment we rented. Yeah. Brought it downstairs, laid it on the, you know, in the main floor because he can't go up and down steps. And yeah. then... Our only um, shower was upstairs in this apartment we had. So we had I had to load him up in the truck, and every three days we'd go up to like the clubhouse, and Holy they had an elevator. Crap. That's why he only got a shower every three days, because that's as much as he could manage. Yeah. So you know. We're so just, when you're like, I'm studying for my law exams, and I have to bathe him every three days, it's it's like it wasn't even. I mean, that was a thing. I was happy to do it at the end of three days. Happy to do that. <laughs> it was more just like the all the other stuff, right? Like making sure that he had. You have. All, I mean, when you're hurt like that. my caretaker. When you're hurt like that, you have accessories, man. You got to have like, like your brace has to be set the, right. You know, you got, you're always on the game ready. So I always have to be on top of the ice, you yeah. know, so he's always doing, you know, these machines. And then, you know, we got to set the crutches up so that when it is time for him to go pee that he can like, I want him to have a sense of independence. So I want him to be able to do the things that he can do. But in order for him to do that, you have to set him up so he can do that. And it was, man, it's it was hard. a whole deal. Pain pills. Well, Pain that's, pills that's were what, good. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing that I don't, I don't think, think that's um, the message here. Oh, it's not that. <laughs> Go back. But I also teased him as he's a spiritual leader. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I, you know, I would also say that I think a lot of times people, you know, people think, oh, the NFL is so glamorous, right? And oh my gosh. And oh my God, Steve, being on stage must be so glamorous. And you know, we had Jose Trevino here, and oh, being a, and and we're finding that you know, uh, it, 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 no matter what you do in life, life is just life. The yeah. juggle, right? You know? Oh yeah. There is, of course, there's fun things that come with being an NFL football player, for sure. But there's also this year that if you had not played football, 
you would not be living right the situation. Well, that's kind of, that's but then you people. also wouldn't have met her. Right. Well, and that's where a lot of people lose sight of their resume. Right. I'm like, I get ticked off at work and where I get like, I hate my boss or whatever's not working out there. But you realize that you've been through all this junk coming up and like you've been able to make it through this kind of trash in your life. You got to think of the strength that you got to have built up to today to be able to have that to withstand just being here. And so um, but a lot of people don't understand that, like our jobs, OK, they're not normal, but um the dynamics of them are very normal in the regular world. And so like, I still deal with people I can't stand. I still deal with assholes once in a while, right? And I still gotta deal with a boss once in a while that doesn't like me, doesn't appreciate me, things get political at work or oh, whatever. I say that all the time where people go, man, must be so great, Steve, to, to be self-employed and do what you want. And I go, <laughs> I still have bosses. Right. Ultimately, I still have to, well. Um, <laughs> But I still have, there's still people that I am responsible for and I have to be there and I have to be held accountable and they are holding me accountable. And there, I mean, there's still, um, things in your life that you're going to have to deal with no matter what. So either, either learn to deal with them or just be miserable all the fucking time. Right. There's no in between. That so, reminds me, sorry to interrupt. That reminds me of the, what Corey hears once in a while. And really it was more in the past, but how people would say, you know, it must be nice to only work 16 days a year. Um, oh, yeah. the worst, the worst. The must, must be nice. Let's be real. I'm yeah. like, that's one of the worst things. There's two, I, I, I say this once. Get them all pissed off. There's two types of people that walk into your house. One is the person that comes in and says, God, man, this is amazing. You've busted your butt to get this and to, and to earn this, right? The other one comes in and says, must be nice. Yeah. Right. And that's the person who doesn't respect or appreciate what went into this. And <clears throat> that's where, that's where so, it's so easy to go into this victim place where... I love the accountability spot. Like, okay, I got this problem. What are you doing about it? And if I can go, I can't fix anything, all, the whole world, but I can do something about it. I can have an influence over it. And so if I got a crappy boss, you better believe I can come to him and be like, listen, I, in order for me to win, you got to win. So how do I get on your page? And there's people just don't do that ever. Yeah. Right? And, but if you see that and you respect it, Right. That's a totally different place to approach versus like, you don't get me. You don't know me. Right. And it's where it's, it's like the world against me kind of attitude, which part of me appreciates because I like the chip on the shoulder. But the other part is like, no, I got to get the other side of the table first before I can really approach it. Because if like I, I can 10 times myself under my own power, but if I'm able to work with my teammate, I can 30, 50, 100 times myself. That's totally different. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and getting the putting the team together that wants to help and wants to work. But I want to go back to the conversation that me and you started right when you pulled up. And then we started talking about it. And I don't know if you noticed, I backed off because I was like, I want to talk about it on the podcast. Don't waste it. <laughs> don't waste yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, man. I totally backed off the conversation. <laughs> what was it? I don't and remember. The conversation about. Is that when you know, and, but was naked? I was say, I didn't <laughs> well, no, no. Renee and I were having the same conversation in the green room last night in Miami. And that was the when your identity changes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So now we are at a point where you are a college football player, you're um, an NFL football player, you are now injured, and now you're a married man. How did it feel when that turning of the page and your identity switches, and how did you deal with it? I, well, I didn't deal well right away i'm naturally an activator i'm like i gotta do i'd much rather play than watch and so that's a good quality about me even to a detriment but like um so I'm like all right i had to go find a job i had a sales gig at first which is a great learning season for me um but we had some things happen uh, where it was just kind of like felt like more was piling on right lost my nephew to cancer mm -hmm. so i've like basically was F the world and we had to walk through that and we had our daughter at the same time and so it was like this oh. conflicting like we've gotten this amazing yeah. gift but so. you've taken this gift right <clears throat> and, what? Oh, okay. and you're no yeah. longer playing for the NFL and that's and I felt like I had more left in the tank for that too right and so and so there was a lot of like this angst and kind of pissed off nature that was built up in me <clears throat> this is where you know she was good because she could like filter it out but um, what it had, I, I ended up, we ended up going to church. She was, was funny. We got invited by some friends. We were sitting there drinking wine, playing games like cards at the house. And the wives were talking about it. And she lets, we let them out of the house. She's like, we're going to go to 11 a.m. service. I'm going to take Grace, our girl. 
and you can come if you want. And like basically drops the mic and walks off. And I'm sitting there like, not in my house. You don't tell me I'm what doing, to do. We're doing you know? And, uh, but I ended up going and what ended up happening was, um, I it had this kind of this massive movement in my faith that wasn't ever there before and <clears throat> had a vision of my nephew, which totally broke me down. And so I, I came into this place, um, where I could basically hear, hear the word of God and, and start working and, and having that thing. So I kind of have this re weird raw side of me where I'm like, have this locker room <laughs> side sure. where I still cuss and do all these things. But I have my face side of me where that's totally exploded where all of a sudden God started showing me a vision in my life about what I was supposed to be past this footballer and past this pain that had taken place. But, but don't you think that things happen for a reason? You know, I, I, I hurt my back playing high school football and it completely changed my life. You know, my dad desperately wanted me to be in the service. My dad wanted me to be, and, and the kind of person I am, I know that I would have been the guy first in, I would, be, I would probably be dead. But I really think that God goes, hey, I have something different for you. Right. And if I hurt you, you can't get in the military, but you can start going in this other path where you have this great talent of being a comedian which also led to her and you know what I mean? So I, don't you think that there's some divine intervention, if you will? A hundred percent. There's but a, that's always <clears throat> something that you can see, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road. Not Nobody's sitting right. in a shit position. Like, <laughs> wow, this is fun. I can't wait to this see what's divine. great coming. <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody, we're still human. Right. So well, I completely course. agree with you, but you know, those first, few I would say that first year where he's just like going to PT mm -hmm. and it's like one bad thing after the other, we didn't have the like we couldn't step back out of the situation long enough to realize what we figured out later which was we basically got to hang out together yeah. and like solidify our relationship yeah. i was i mean i studied for the bar and you know had like a few little odd jobs but nothing huge so for the first two years of our life we basically hung out together and solidified our friendship and our marriage which yeah. was how many people get to do that yeah. like right. immediately, right? Which, yeah. But, but it, at the moment, do you see that, right? No, we no, just we thought didn't. we were walking through it, you know, right. getting, you know, move, moving from this set of PT. Oh, shoot, your knee's still infected. Another round of, like, go get that pick line put back in, you know, let's check this out. And then he hurts his tricep and it's a whole, you know. And you just keep moving and moving. Oh, and yeah. Moving. And yeah, you right? just keep going. But we then looking back, we're like, holy cow, we've been through a lot and we have grown, right? Right. So it's been it's it's just been a great journey I wouldn't do anything different you know and there were times then when I was like man I, I remember praying very specifically that Corey would like be essentially acknowledged for like all the hard work he was doing you know he's busting his butt trying to get back he was huge he was strong all the stuff and then he got hurt and I'm like well shoot you know <laughs> well, later no on, yeah. <laughs> well you know a couple months later he ended up getting a tryout with the Saints with coach Peyton yeah right and um, it's funny because at that that day when he told me about what you what Sh what Sean Payton said to you, I was like, "Well, shoot! I wish I would have <laughs> prayed something different." Because <laughs> Sean Payton basically gave him exactly what I was praying for, and he yeah. basically said to you, "What did he say to you?" Well, yeah, he said, "You're everything we want." And you, he, he said, said you're, "You're everything we want," but you know how this business is. We got young guys that are cheaper. We're gonna try these guys out, and then if something happens, we're gonna call you. But um, but you're everything we, we want in this locker room. Didn't he say so, something like you deserve a spot on a team somewhere? Yeah. 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 He did say that. And yeah. so in my mind, I'm like, there it is. Yeah. He's acknowledged. Right. But all this time I had been praying for him to like, feel like everything he was doing was worth something. And then he got exactly that. But I'm like, well, I didn't really want it that way. I wanted it a different way. So it's just been it's been funny to be able to look back and see the whole journey now but like we were saying you know nobody ever sits in it like this is so fun i can't yeah. wait to see my growth but but yeah. the problem I, you know i don't know if it's a problem and, and i think corey could speak more on it but to me i see this issue with you're you're revered as a kid you're revered through high school you go to college you're revered you're now you're in the nfl but you're still a very young man yeah and then all of a sudden no more. So you see a lot of guys that really go down the deep end. Yeah. And they just don't, they don't know how to manage. I mean, you've, you've, you've been, you've peaked at such a high level, 
right? And a fame and people love you. And then all of a sudden that is gone. Yeah. Right? Now you're an ex Dallas Cowboy. Former. Or it's former. former. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nobody former, says yeah. ex. Yeah. Relax. You're not a Marine. Right? <laughs> 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 um, but, but, you know, for you, do you, I mean, there had to be a moment of, I'm going to pick myself up. Peyton gave me the, the, what I needed. Mm hmm. And now it's time to move on with my life, right? Or was it in that moment? There, well, yeah, yes, that comes for everybody, right? But the thing, I think everybody kind of works through this same, a similar path anyways, or emotional kind of walk through is, is like, oh, first, okay, either cut, you get hurt or whatever. Nobody's calling anymore. So the phone doesn't ring. Nobody's really interested. And, uh, and so there's this... Uh, frustration that's taking place one that you're not wanted and okay now i'm trying to call my coaches and those coaches that were preaching um loyalty loyalty to me won't return any of my phone calls all of a sudden and so now you're like feeling betrayal right because you're like what you know like, what happened yeah what phone. are you talking it's about you loved me. yeah you loved me yeah right and so like you're 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 like just washing me away right now you can't even call me back like there's no respect there and so and so, like, we all we kind of go through these things, like, what the hell am I if, if I'm not? This is all I've poured myself into my whole life. And and I've, like, sacrificed my body and my soul for what everything coach wants me to do, only for you to tell me I don't need you anymore, right? I've considered this my family forever. And when your family says, now nah, I'm good, that hurts. Yeah, it breaks and, your heart, man. And so it's, it's essentially kind of walking through a death right where i gotta mourn this loss i don't want to i'm not trying to so guys especially we get pissed off we break things and we go through this walk now all of a sudden where it can be it can be pretty toxic right it can get turned to booze you can turn to pain pills well, and, and, and i you know i, I just places. had that i had that conversation with a friend of mine who coaches at my former high school you know when i got hurt man i was the guy coaches high fives we love you trevino Hey, buddy, you're in my classes. I mean, the whole thing. I get hurt, and they won't even make eye contact. Right. And I, I was just having this conversation with him where I go, you know, okay, NFL, get over it. You're more of a man. They got, they're they getting paid millions of dollars to coach. They got to go to the next guy. I can kind of understand. But I told him, I go, when you're a high school coach, mm. you have a resp moral responsibility to take care of these kids. Yeah. To treat them like kids. I go, that could have destroyed me. That could have wrecked me. And these, these coaches literally went from high fives in the hallways to turning their back and not even talking to me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't do that to children. You know, and, and the culture, in my opinion, needs to change in the fact that that's what I love about Travis Bush, who, who I introduced you to at the Cougars. You know, Travis has a mentality of, yes, I want to win games, but I want to send out good men into, right. our, into our communities. Yeah. Right. And that to me is the right mentality versus the, I'm going to turn my back. You but know? that's, that's, it's, it's more, it's a sign on their character when yeah. they do that, right. Than on you. But it's even up to the league, you, you think you're playing a ball game. And even in the league, your life is structured so much for you that you're almost not fully developing as a young man right there. I don't have to take, full onus for all of my responsibilities because my responsibilities are handled for me. And, and not to compare so, it to the military yeah. because the military, obviously there's so many more, uh, but it's kind of military-esque. Similar. Right? Your yeah. Workouts at this time, breakfast is at this time, your breaks at this time, right? And it's like, come in and you're indoctrinated really and almost institutionalized. hundred percent. Right? And that's why so many guys, that's why we can relate with military guys because we, all of a sudden you're out and you're out of the structure and I got to make choices on my own right now and I'm like, how do I even do that, right? What am I supposed to do? And so kind of come back to Renee, that moment, <clears throat> we were training in New Jersey. We we're there for about 15 months, 13, 15 months, something like that. And uh, trying to get back, nothing was happening. I'm watching slop on the field. I'm cussing at my agents for not being able to get me a shot, doing something. And, and it was just kind of, you know how this comes to a point like any problem where you're just like, I don't care anymore. You do what you want, right? Yeah, you're like you just like I, yeah. I give, I release it, and it came to this point where it was one of those frust, like the frustration had hit a boiling point where I didn't want to fight it anymore, and that was finally when um, 
I don't remember if it was me or you, but I remember like acknowledging that like, we got to do something for ourselves. I can't keep waiting on someone else's choice or opinion of me to determine my life. Well, Renee and I are like, oh, funny you're telling your story. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Renee and I are, are fire. I'm fire. And then she brings more fire. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't need more fucking fire right now. I need ice. I need water. I need you to cool me the cool fuck off. Right, right. We're able to bring more fire, right? But in the moments that really matter for me, she then will be the calmer. Yeah. She will be the one that comes to me and goes, hey, you know, I remember literally coming to her one night. I was only being able to perform at Mexican night. Right. And it was, really? oh, you can perform at Refried Friday and you can perform at Mexican Monday. And, wow. you know, and, and I remember sitting on the bed with Renee going, man, you know, they want me to be really, really Mexican. Yeah. They want George Lopez. Maybe I should be George Lopez. And I remember her going, no, you're not going to do that. We're doing this together and it is going to work. And that was a moment for me where I was like, I really needed you there. Instead of her going, fuck them, and, you know what I mean, and firing me up. And then again, during the pandemic, man, I was depressed, mm. you know, and, and I was a slob and I wouldn't get off the sofa. And, and she finally came up to me and she goes, no, this is not you. You're going to get up and you're going to fight and we're going to do something together. So at, at, how were you feeling when he was going through That's all good wife. That's yeah. good wife, man. Come yeah. On. Yeah. But that's what makes the team. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we're here to lift each other up, you know, and I think accountability is part of it too, but doing so with empathy is like, you know, I'm it's not my job to be his keeper, right? We're here to here to lift each other up and to do well together, but not, you know, if I was to just come at him, I mean, there were a few things we had to address, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. He was on the couch with his CPM, his little knee mover and <laughs> that's a whole thing, you know. I mean, we had a lot of stuff and it was you know, it was, it was such a good experience. The whole deal was a good learning experience. But, but I got to say, that. for you guys, it's hard because, you know, in our life together, there was this clear path of what I was doing, what I wanted to do, her supporting me and her doing the same thing in her acting world. So we already knew our path. You wanted to be a lawyer. Now you're sitting there going, mm -hmm. now what? That's, it, it, was, it was rough. Like, I always knew football was going to go. It didn't go. So now we're having to pivot. What the heck am I supposed to do? And this is where she was good in the same way, right? And I, and I love it because there's a proverb that talks about the uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so like you have an ability to speak to him during almost a deathly moment, right? Where you could bring life into a moment that needed it. And so this is what's so powerful about those teammates is we need that. And especially from our spouse. Um, <clears throat> but it was, it was, good for me because she started doing those things to me where I was like, okay, I started, I was like, okay, I'm going to go back to school. I'll finish my degree. Cause I don't want to be a hypocrite when grace wants to go back to school and I tell her she's got to finish. Right. And so I, I do that. That's good procrastinator for the minute. Um, then I'm close to getting close to graduating now and we got to look at getting a job and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Cause I'm about done with this and pick, getting picked up by a team didn't happen. And she was, that's where she was great. Cause she was like, okay, Call Bill Ferrario, who is a guy who played with the Packers for a while. Call call this guy and see what he did to to move because on. Because they both, well, the people that I remember, and I don't really remember this very clearly, but just, just in that example and thinking about my mindset, they had all success. They had been sort of in Corey's situation, right, where they were not starters. So it's not like you know they any of them had you know, that huge contract where they had the huge cushion in the bank. Yeah. Um, but then they had you know football ended and they had all successfully transitioned into a, a career. Yeah. And maybe it might be a little bit of a rough go to get there. Yeah. But ultimately they get to a point where they find a place where they can succeed and they can do well. And if another you know if if nothing else. I mean, Corey can do a lot of things, but he can take coaching incredibly well. So to talk to another guy who had done it mm -hmm. successfully, another guy who was in his boat, right? Transitioned. Yeah, yeah. and he had see, he maybe he hears some of the, even if you pick up one thing from the one person, right? If you talk to three or four people, then you'll have kind of a better idea about maybe how to even approach it. So that was my thought because it's not my job to tell him what to do. You know, ultimately at the end of the day, he knows. She just gave me ideas. He knows what he has to do. <clears throat> well, that's what I love. So I'm like, even if you're going to do the wrong, you'll do more damage doing nothing than doing the wrong thing. 
And I tell people all the time, I am wise because I've done a lot of the wrong thing. Right. <laughs> but it's it's true though, I right? I continue to fuck up. And yeah. uh, so when you're going through it, I'm like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> We learn learn two ways, on purpose or on accident. One of them hurts, right? And I would rather learn on purpose where you tell me, like, hey, watch out for this coming down the pipe. Sure. Uh-huh. And I'm like, guess what? I can make the right move and not screw it up. Um, that's a totally different wisdom. But it was great because she was like, okay, try this. So I go to Billy. He's like, go into sales. You like to talk. You like to BS with people. And so he goes, look on, look on LinkedIn. So I found a job on LinkedIn, legit. And, um, which was a great season me going into, which kind of led into the tough places that we were in further and into our faith, which really opened, exploded a whole different world, which is where we're at right now. And so, um, I, I love making moves and taking steps because even if they're wrong, so what if it's wrong? You know, you course correct now. I know that's not right. And I'm going to come back and try something else. Can I tell people all the time? I think, I think one of the, the the biggest talents I have other than um, comedy is that my ability to continue to shift. Yeah. Right. And I, I find I, in this business, especially my business where you see these comedians and they, they continue to do the same thing year after year after year after year, which by the way is the definition of insanity. Right. And I go, man, I would go this direction and go, Oh, there's a wall. No big deal. I'll, you know, and I kept going, all right, how come I'm not advancing? Why am I not going to the next level? Well, maybe I need to do this. And I just kept shifting and shifting and shifting. And okay, well, I'm not going to get a special from uh, a network. I'm not going to wait around for it. Then how else can I do it? So I continued Mm -hmm. to do the same thing. And I think that you have the same personality that I have of let's just keep shifting. You're you're similar because I think we've, it was funny because when we get together, your mind is constantly flowing through so many different ideas. What if we try this? What if we try this? What if we try this? And like, you might even try just one or two of them, but um, it's why people end up being successful, right? It's why Elon Musk has held so many failed businesses, but how many have popped? Right. Um, he's the richest guy in the world. And so you think of things like that, where there's so many people that, I, <clears throat> I, sp- I like with these young guys too, to talk about this. So many people have not met enough walls that um, they constantly just stop at the wall. Right, like I only see A to B, and if there's one wall in my way, I, well, I guess I can't get to B, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, that's a different the, question. The, I think the biggest, you know? the most frustrating part is that no matter what, it's very rare you meet somebody that listens to your advice mm-hmm. and actually executes. Right. They have to then go live it and go, oh, he was right. Like, you just wasted a lot of fucking time, dude. <laughs> I told you to go this way. You insisted on going that way. You gotta figure it out for yourself, though. Right. That's but so we, many all, of us. we all have to go through it. So then you end up in finance. That was, that was not something I expected to be in ever. Um, <clears throat> what was funny was, <clears throat> excuse me. I, so, like, when you come into your faith, and I, I share this a lot of people, when you come into your faith, God starts. Uh, sharing a vision on your life and scripture even talks about without vision my people will perish and what that means basically if you don't have a vision for your your life for your marriage for your work for your place whatever it is you have it will perish it will fall apart because eventually and you probably met this in some relationship where you're like where are we going with this i don't know we better figure it out real fast which is basically get the vision or else this is done right because if there's no vision it's gone and so but, all of us, but, but all the motivational speakers talk about that, whether it's through the Bible, through faith or t- Tony Robbins calls it the blueprint. Okay. Yeah. Right. Do you have a blueprint in your head you, and, and whatever blueprint you have in your head, that vision is going to become you. Right. Right. So if you're a kid in, in, in high school going, well, my life is meant to be, I'm going to prison because all my family went to prison and I'm going to, well, that's your fucking blueprint. dude. Right. Guess what? You've envisioned it and you followed that path and now here you are right fucking surprise <laughs> you know and for me i was lucky that the the only vision i ever had was i'm going to be a comedian from eight years old that's what i'm going to do so now here i am so what happened right nobody in your family was comedian nobody <laughs> they're hilarious but it, they're yeah. Just, yeah yeah they don't get paid to do it <laughs> <laughs> but it's there so that's then, what's crazy i mean it, so then ahead. you ended up on this path well, so this, it started developing and <clears throat> what was funny is, um, speaking engagements started coming. 
So I started getting filled up. I started eating like crazy. Lots of book. Lots of. I was not a big reader. Reading before. books is what he means, Re- and yeah, learning information. He's not talking about yeah. food. Yeah. I was always <laughs> smart, but eat. I didn't. I didn't really <laughs> crave to eat information, Eating, right? Yeah. And so um, I, th- I started getting speaking engagements from just having substance. And uh, in every one of the crowds, there was always a financial guy. Everyone wanted to pursue me. And there was um, a natural pull there. And I listened to them all. They all had great things to say, but it wasn't right. None of it. And so, um, I, and so I started to ask a question. I'm like, okay, why do you have me? Why are you saying something? Because usually when something's repeated several times like that, there's obviously communication trying to take place. And so I'm gravitating towards this and start moving in this direction, but I'm not really sharing it with anybody. And I don't like to share it unless I'm all in on something. And what was funny was um, I had done, I was super frugal with my money from the league. Um, My advisor did well with it, helped me make some money, which did really good stuff. But when I started asking that question, I'm like, why uh, am I going this route? That's when uh, what's funny was God kind of said, well, remember the wreck. And what had happened is I all of a sudden remembered um, I had gotten into a wreck in high school, my junior year, rear-ended a lady, super seamless, but she ended up filing a lawsuit against my mom, my stepdad and uh didn't help any of the situation and it was it brought a lot of stress without going into all the details but a lot brought a lot of stress onto the family and um that basically paved the way with how i behaved with money and so when i got to the league i was afraid of that kind of repeating itself and and i kind of slowly stepped onto this path of learning everything that i could and from that was born the uh, the principal nature of my company. I started Pro Capital Wealth Management, um, where I talk about standing guard and building legacy. And what that is is basically I want to put somebody's life in a lockbox to keep it from being subject to judgment and lawsuit or some other train wreck. But you know what's cool for 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 me and you and for us is that the position that we're in, we get offered help. Yeah. Right. Like I have learned everything I have learned because of the position that we're in, because of the bankers that we have, because of the CPAs that we have, because of yourself where you go, Hey, let me help you. Let me tell you what to do. Let me right. But the problem is that before Renee and I became anything, we had no fucking clue (laughs) because nobody wanted to help us. Right. Nobody wanted to talk to us and go, Hey, you can buy a house and this is how you do it. Mm. Oh, Hey, you should have life insurance. And this is how you should do it, right? But it wasn't until we started making money that people started coming to us going, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Can I help you? Can I show you? You know, and, and that's one of the things that, that you know, has, has why we love you is because you're always willing to talk to us. You're always willing to explain to us because we are make financial decisions for dummies at this point. And you, you are always willing to talk us through it because we're afraid. Yeah. Right. And we're like, we don't understand what's going on. And, you know, Renee, uh, with five months ago, she's like, call Corey. All our money's going away. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, stop looking at our account. Oh my goes, Corey's not panicking. We shouldn't panic. <laughs> like, but that fucking stock market's going bad. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, but what would you say, you know, is the biggest misconception when it comes to um, people being able to set their life up? I, people not getting involved with it you know i i still remember um one of the first times i decided to just put a spreadsheet together and start tracking my own spending or our spending and the mm-hmm. first time i came to megan and told her that we spent 10 grand in a month which was years ago uh-huh. and she was like no we're not no we didn't we just spent 10 grand and um and i'm like well according to this excel spreadsheet that i just typed out <laughs> and she did exactly that she just kind of looks at it and she's like oh, whatever and walks off, right? Don't and make it seem I, like I'm out there. No, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not saying that. We can but, talk about this. We can circle back, okay? But what happened was like we we were, I really did a deep dive where she handled a lot of stuff before at one point, and so I did a deep dive and figured out where we were. Right? What's the quickest way to growth? You got to know where you're standing, and so I figured out where we were at, what we were spending, and our own current behavior with money. Um, before we could make any steps forward. And I, and I, so I tell a lot of people, my basic practice a lot right now is first every month to just to get out a piece of paper 
and look to see what you spent in all your accounts and what you made. And okay, is that a negative or positive balance now? And so if people aren't aware of what's happening in their accounts, this is why fraud is so big, right? Is they're not aware of what's happening in their accounts, um, that they're more susceptible to their own behavioral risks, their own problems and torpedo in their own life, which is the highest probability. And so I, I say just like dive into your money and look at it first, right? Dive into your account, see what you're spending, see what adds up, see what's reoccurring, see if there's good or bad happening. And then when you start seeing the behaviors, you start making yourself more, way, way more aware like at the, at the store. And okay, now when I, when the best people, the best uh, that I love working with, they see their money stack, they get aware of that and then money starts stacking in the bank. And all of a sudden they have several hundred thousand dollars or depending on what the income level is, they might have more. And they're all of a sudden like, dude, what do I, do? I got 300 grand sitting in my bank account. What do I do now with what? that? And, um, and I'm like, good, it's a good problem. And now we go put it to work. All right. Now <clears throat> we can go into a lot of different places, but now we can go, we have choices and that's what money today that so many people chase affords you is choices right and so like um if we don't have any money all right that's also a good thing because where's a good place to go to work <laughs> to go right. make it but um but it's security in our bank but account, i also right? tell people the same thing when it comes to real estate you know renee and i felt like buying a house was impossible and mm. and once we did it we're like oh shit we could do this yeah why did we think it was impossible? Yeah. But I tell people, any income level that you're at, like you said, if you look at your money and go, hey, I have a goal, I have a blueprint, I have a way I want to go, and you can buy a house. Mm -hmm. The problem is that nowadays everybody wants the big house. Right. And I always go, man, buy that small house, fix it up, spend a year, and either rent it or flip it or go buy it, you know, take that money, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Because 1% a day, in 365 days is a lot. Yeah. Right. And and that's always my mentality. And it's kind of the same thing that you've taught me. It's well, it's, it's do something. I, I I love. There's a lot of good people that will come and they're and they were like, man, I just don't know what I'm doing. But they've like invested, they've saved and invested and put in all these different places. And I'm like, holy cow, you guys are already. You guys are just doing this all yourselves and you're kicking ass at this, right? Okay, let's just put it together and see how it fits in our life. What else could we do with that? And so. You know, those are fun, right? As opposed to um, seeing somebody's money on the on the chart just run out, and you're like, "There's not much I can do with you." I can I can sit here and tell you to start putting money away in the account every month, and that's good. But um, you know, people, you, you kind of have to come to this self realization or this emotional place where like, "I'm I'm done being this way," and that's where a lot of cool people on the other side have been. I got, I got some people of mine right now uh, uh, in that exact scenario where they came from dirt broke. And they're basically like, they've talked about, I'm never going back to that again because I know what it feels like, right? And so- Well, I tell her, I, I have that fear. I, I, don't, I don't take time off because I have a fear of not having anything. No. There is no safety net for me. There is no going back. There is, you know, and I, I, like I tell her, I go, I have this pride inside of me that I can't ever look at my kids and my wife and go, hey, I fucked all this off. Like somewhere I fucked up. Yeah. You know, so I am constantly working, but I also am, and you probably hate this, I have the mentality of I'll just make more money. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mentality, right? Or yeah. we hear, we hear, I hear sometimes quite a bit, I hear, a, well, I don't intend to have anything left by the time I die. I'm just going to spend it because you only live once, which I think is. Yolo, whatever. Yolo. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is true. You only live once. I know. But, uh, but then uh, what I mean, about your kids? I don't know. It's but no, but like, that was the most important thing that that Renee, you know, Renee was way ahead of the game in our relationship, where she was like, "You don't have life insurance, and we need life insurance." And we don't have like, health insurance. Yeah. We like, don't have health insurance. Health yeah. insurance. Yeah. And I was like, "Okay, okay, okay. I'll get, I'll get life insurance." And then again, once Corey, helped, once you helped me through it, I was like, "I could have done this a long time ago. It wasn't yeah. that hard? Yeah, it wasn't that difficult, and it's not." I mean, obviously, Renee and I have a, a little more expensive plan, but you don't have to have. What's the, what's the cheapest life insurance plan you can pay for a month? Well, I mean, it depends on your rating that a company right. would give you, right? So, if like if you're great health, it'll be really cheap. And you're young, so right? young yeah. and great health, it'll be cheap. You're a little older, and depending on your health, it's a whole lot more expensive. Well, so, I remember when we did the thing, they were like, uh, 
They're like, do you smoke? I'm like, nope, don't smoke. And then Corey calls me and goes, there's nicotine in your system. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? I go, she said smoke. Uh, <laughs> I chew. She didn't ask me if I chew. That's a good point. I, go, I mean, I go, that's an important <laughs> distinction, really. She specifically said, do yeah. you smoke? I said, bitch, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I just use tobacco. Yeah. It's different. Way different. I agree. I agree with you. Totally. But there's got to be a sense of, of, of feeling good that you're helping families set their lives up. Is there a sense of that? Oh, totally. It's I, I think it's cool uh, for me because you guys have seen like I'll, I'll put a lot of times I'll put somebody's life up on a screen, right? Where it's projection. And, and I'm like, listen, you're right here. Like you see this tiny little blip. You don't feel like you have much. You can't even 10 years down the road doesn't look like a ton. You look like halfway, three quarters in the way of your life. Sorry, but <laughs> love you. You see how this big chunk and you see how your life compounds on itself. You talk about like a guy like Warren Buffett. He didn't make his full wealth till after 50. And I'm like, Warren Buffett's one of the richest guys in the world, right? Who built his life on investing. And I'm like, he didn't have the full compounding effect of that, the dividends from his own portfolios, the massive, massive effects till after 50 years old. And so you think about that in your life, which is typical, the top earning years in a guy's life is in his 50s. And well, what comes from that? It's, it's the experience that he's had on the job. It's uh, all, the, all the things that it takes into producing a good, a good valuable worker, right? And time, yeah, time and all, the, all those good things. And so um, I love showing that because one, if you can give them vision, the vision of it, they'll want to grasp at it. And <clears throat> I had this, so I, got, I got some players too, right? And I, had, um, I showed a player and his wife how much they were spending and how fast it was going to run out. They're making a, a massive amount of money right now while we're playing ball. That shuts off. And uh, nobody at, wants... At, a, at an early age. Right. And nobody wants... We don't want like we don't want to hear it because... Don't tell me I'm going to stop working, right? Because right. I'm still trying to play, make the team do all these and, things. And by the way, I'm having fun. Can right. I have fun? I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. Right. Yeah, but then you're not going to be able to enjoy it forever. Right. Right. And so what's neat is, okay, <clears throat> we can show that. And this one I think of... Him and his wife like jumped out of their seat when I showed them how fast the money was going to run out when they were done with some assumptions, and they got physically uncomfortable in the room. And uh, it was cool because like okay, let's start laddering this down just a little bit on our spending, just incrementally, and see how it affects your life. And you see how many years and how many how many dollars are left over uh, left over yeah. every time. And so. We ended up putting them on a salary, on their own personal salary rather than from the team and totally different story. And you, what was cool is I like it, especially when guys take control of themselves and do this, right? But like the guy was like, immediately we're talking about budget and like how much you wanted to budget for the month. And, and they were talking about the house and they're like, man, what about this? And it's like, okay, we can move here. And the guy like stopped it. He was like, nope, I'm going to keep it at X dollars. This is where we're going to be. We're going to make, because when you shut it down, you see how much it changes the projection of your life. He was like, no, I'm going to have this. I'm going to make sure our kids are taken care of. And it was a totally different conversation. Yeah. It was awesome. Well, but I think kids also make you think way different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, once you have kids, you're like, I mean, I, I'm doing a joke right now where I go, there's nothing worse than that young couple that's like, I know what it's like to have kids because I have a dog. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> that is the dumbest shit you could ever say. And Renee and I used to say it. Right? Like, I was just going to say, who says that? <laughs> yeah. Kids without kids. Yeah. Yeah. Kids without kids. Yeah, right. yeah, I, yeah. I, I, in my joke, I go, if my dog gets hit by a car... I just go get another one. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like a kid. Do you have a dog right, right now? Should no. I go? Okay. No, just, I cannot. <laughs> I have not recovered. Oh. Um, okay. it, was a, it was a tough loss. But, um, but again, when you have kids, you have this moment of like, what am I going to do for them? How do I give them the opportunities, number one, that I never had? And number mm -hmm. two, a sense of, of security that, you know, we are... We are the we are the first generation of money, you know. I always say that like, there's people that get inherited lots of money, and there's people that get inherited debt. Yeah, you know where there's nothing coming from, you know, and and those are the people that end up having to climb out of that, right? And you want to set your kids up in a situation where they can pursue their dreams and they can go do, um, they can go to school longer if they want, 
Hey, you want to go be a doctor? Go be a doctor. Right. You want to do eight years? Go do eight years. You're going to be fine. You know, instead of that person that goes, well, I can't afford to be a doctor. I'm going to go be a nurse. Well, changes everything. Right. right? And Renee and I talk about it all the time. What if I die tomorrow? Mm-hmm. What if I get hit by a, you know, the, my plane goes down? Uh, where does that leave my family? Yeah. Right. So Corey comes in and says, well, tell him you smoke, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> It's, so, uh, it's, it's fun, man. It's cool because it, we naturally have those fears, right? Like, what's what? what and, and, but you don't have those I didn't fears until, until I had you have kids. kids. So. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. We're reckless when we're single yeah. or, or single or like even without kids. We're not have full responsibilities, right? But <clears throat> we naturally have a lot of fear. A lot of people, there's, there's, I hate the politician game that they play, right? Where they were like, it, they bastardize the wealthy. And I'm like, stop, stop. That was earned somewhere along the way by somebody but what people don't understand they're like they do this must be nice to be rich must be nice to be wealthy must be nice to have money and they don't get that everybody's human everybody has these emotions and everybody has a fear and and so like even with the most wealthy there's still a fear of everything going away because I've seen it before and when you got somebody like myself and like yourself and uh, the four of us here like I, I didn't have anything yeah I didn't have, when I tell you nothing, not a dollar from my parents, everything I've done is on my own. Now I finally fucking make a lot of money and I'm being told, well, if you make over this amount, you have to pay more than the person next to you. And I'm like, well, I, this wasn't inherited. I, nobody <laughs> fucking gave me this shit. Right. I sacrificed, I worked my ass off to get here and now I, you gotta take that from me? I'm, I'm not okay with it. It's, you know? it's awful, it's rough. Somebody just stroked a two million dollar check to the government for a, a big capital gain, and you're like, well, "I'm doing the, the smart thing to invest," and you're telling me I got to pay more on top of this. It's, right. it's well, garbage. It's I can't stand it. And we got what do, what do we have? Eighty seven thousand new IRS agents coming yeah, in, so 000. that'll be fun. Well, I have, I have one more question for the bo- a couple more questions for the both of you. Um, I know you have Hank. Yes. Would, are you going to encourage Hank into football? I'll let How do you him, feel about it? I'm fine with it. I'll let him choose, right? But I want him and Grace, both our kids, do a lot of sports. Try a lot of things. I want you exposed. But to I'm talking about that. football specific, mm-hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, I broke my back playing football, and I really try not to encourage Garrett in football. Don't get me wrong. If he wants to do it and he comes to me passionately and says, I want to play football, he can play it. But I don't He's also not it. genetically inkind for football. Hank might be. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I feel like uh, that's a little different conversation. How do you feel about it after reason. everything you've been through, after your knee, after your, the way your body feels? Uh, I want to hear Megan actually more because how do you feel about it? I, I mean, honestly, I, I think if that's what he wants to do and he likes, I mean, I don't see a problem with it. I would 100% let him do it. Now, would I go buy like the most pos- expensive available helmet? Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll like buy all the bubble wrap that I can put around it. <laughs> but I think that the the pros outweigh the cons, right? I mean, the value of team sports, and yeah, you could apply it to any sport, right? But I think the value of team sport and the character building, not only that, but just benefits for your body, right? Um, Being able to relate to people. I know know that there's such a big problem these days with kids just being able not, you know, this this is a huge generalization. Socially, though. Yeah, just being able to walk up to another kid and start a conversation and be able to, like, connect with other kids. So team sports, obviously, they can't be on their phone while they're running drills. So, you know, I just think it's, I just think it's a a great thing. I mean, I talk about that all the time. Like I I run into guys, I I get along most with the guys that have been in locker rooms. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are the guys I get along with most. If, if, you know, and, and, and military guys, I get along with those guys Mm -hmm. right away. Same, same atmosphere. There's a brotherhood. There's a, you know, Mm -hmm. my, my, the guys I played ball with in high school are still my friends. Yeah. We're still close, you know. Still so, talk shit, right? Oh, we're still talking yeah. a lot of shit. I talk shit to this guy every time I, I see him. I know. That's, that's why you get along. We're always. Yeah, I'm on stage and be like, "Oh, folks, Shrek's here." And then, yeah, <laughs> they turn around and Corey's over there. <laughs> <laughs> we were gonna go as like the Shrek family for our Halloween a couple years ago. And I forgot. <laughs> forgot about it, man. Now I remembered. So um, now the other question I have for you is: is what does it take to play at such a high level? Now, don't get me wrong. Let's take let's take the physical side of it out. Mm-hmm. But mentality wise, what does it take for all those dads out there that really want their kid to play pro ball, D one ball? It's not about what the dad wants. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. What is that mentality? 
There, there was um, a really great documentary I watched. We watched just a little bit ago that like encapsulated uh, it perfectly. What was it? I don't know. It was on Hulu though, it was wasn't on, it? Yeah, it was on Hulu. I can't, I can't remember the name of it, but <clears throat> it had Wayne Gretzky, Jordan, like some um, of the top Mark athletes, Marciano, you know, great, bunch right? Of sports. Some of these great, so right? <clears throat> and this is this is how I, I related it the same way. Gretzky had that same question. He goes, "Man, I get I come up to it, and all these dads come up to me and like." These kids want to be huge hockey players. And they're like, tell my kid how many shots he needs to take a day. Like 500,000 shots a day, whatever. Tell him how many. And he's like, there is no number. And there was actually a study that was done that followed this big uh, group of kids. Some that went pro in their sports, some that didn't. And I found the ones that went professional in their sports had far more unstructured playtime in their life than structured practice time. Meaning, I'm, I'm not here just taking 500 shots. I'm legit playing the game forever because I'm a kid and I like to play outside mm-hmm. and play the game. The desire to do the so. The desire to do so. Yeah. They naturally got better. They got more creative in the game because they're screwing around, figuring out how ways to score on their kid, on their yeah. friends. They're talking trash. <laughs> they're doing all these things and they're having fun playing the game. Right. And I still remember, and the way I think why that resonated with me is because I used to play street hockey with my brother every day. And we played basketball every day. Now, whatever season it was in my neighborhood, we were playing. We were playing. Oh, yeah. Right? When it was baseball season, we were playing baseball. You told football me- season would come around and get the guys together and let's play football. Right. right? My favorite thing, I love off-season conditioning because I love trying to beat the other guys. And it's you just competing, screwing around with each right. other. It's like playing a game. And so, like, Casey and I, my brother, we'd be in the front yard throwing the football every day. Every day, and we'd we'd flip out like because we make a stupid catch just playing one against each other. And that was it, and and that's where I would encourage people is like get your kid outside, have fun playing the game, have fun playing the game, well, have fun playing the game. I'm so lucky that I mean Garrett's an amazing baseball player, and and dads come up to me all the time and they go, what 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 do I do? What are you doing? You can you know? totally sell a supplement right uh, there. You know, yeah. right? I mean, just saying. But but I tell the dads, I go, I deer velvet. Just- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Trevino One drop nutsack. under the tongue a day. Trevino nutsack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. um, but I tell the dads, I go, I go, we just play ball. Yeah. We go out in the front yard, and I always tell my son, this is the most valuable time, son. Yeah. I love playing ball with you. Oh yeah. You know, and I'm making him dive, and we're playing, and we're and we're just playing ball. Yeah. You know, and, and I tell the dads, I go, just go play ball, man. Don't there's no drills, there's no, you know, and I think you know we we have a very good little baseball team. Um, and we went undefeated last year. And I think it's because, I'm, man, I'm out there and, and my other coach, we're screaming, we're having a good time, we're having fun, we're making it exciting, you know. But, but there still is, because I, I am professional at what I do, there is a, in my brain at least, a I am going to do this. Mm-hmm. There is no I hope to do this, I think I can do this. It is I am going to do this. Did you have that in your head or um man i (laughs) there was it was i guess it started there was an attraction that started happening when i started seeing other guys go through it right and so like when i was i started getting college letters sophomore year of high school i never thought that was going to be a thing but all of a sudden i got a letter from oregon which was the first recruiting letter that i got and i'm like that's cool that's cool right that makes you feel good and Scouts started showing up at school. They wanted to talk to me. Coaches started showing up, wanted to talk to me. It makes me feel good. Now, now it's like this is a full-on thing that's happening where I can earn a scholarship. And okay, yeah, that's happening. So I'm making a choice. That's going on. And then when I get to college, I'm seeing other guys compete at their pro day my freshman year and watching them trying to go. And all of a sudden, these pro teams are showing up at our pro day at Montana for to watch these guys run 40s and stuff and running through drills. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. That would be pretty neat to be able to do that. And so I just started getting attracted to it where, yeah, I want to do that. Like, I, I want to go be that good, right? And I always, I was very much, coaches were huge in my life. And so those were very much like father figures to me where if, if, if you told me something good, I ate it up like crazy. And I still remember the first time, the very first time that happened, like with a, kind of the light bulb turned on for football for me was seventh, year, seventh grade, my first time playing ball. And we're doing Oklahoma drill, which is like outlawed now, just because dumb coaches don't know how to run it. But um, but coach needed a ball. It was just two a D lineman, O lineman, 
and a running back and a linebacker. And it's basically run at each other as hard as you can and see who can hit the other, right? And we needed a ball carrier. Coach threw me the ball, and he was like, Proctor, you do this. For whatever reason, I just decided to go hard on that play. I couldn't tell you why. And I trucked the linebacker. <laughs> and coach freaked out, flipped out, and started praising me, right? Oh, yeah, Proctor and going crazy and jumping on me. Well, that just gave me this massive Fire. high, yeah. right? And I wanted more of that. And so this is where like the playing with your kids, and this is where I'm like, this. I love this natural play time because the hard work will develop from that praise. And like guys are like, how do I get my kid more aggressive? I go, you don't. Help them to work hard. Help them to do, give high effort, right? Encourage those things because aggression will come. And eventually it did for me. And so... When that turned on, then if a different football player came out. Right. And so now we're talking about that earlier where it's not a big teddy bear on the football field anymore. Now that aggression showed up from that effort. Somebody and, who wants to win. Right. right. And so now you're out hurting people on the football field. But it translates to it, life. You right. Know, you want to win in life. Right. Oh, yeah. You know. That is totally, totally different. Um, right. Well, do us a favor. Let everybody know where they can find you. If you want financial advice or help, <laughs> uh, you can Instagram with, with my friend Corey here. What, what is your Instagram and Facebook? And you, can, you can go follow at Corey Proctor. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Pro Capital Wealth Management. ProCapitalTX.com is my site. Right, Tip, Typical people that I serve are usually in the 1 to 3 million range. And uh, it's a lot of athletes, but families that are trying to figure out what the next step is for their life after they've built it to a certain place. So That's awesome. Um, you need to talk. My wife is the best though. Estate planning attorney. She will kick anyone's ass. So <laughs> she knows what's up. And rip the throat out of powerful so. team. Uh, <laughs> and then the last the last question is I've always felt that Tony Romo was underrated. Do you agree with that? Or oh, no? totally. He got a lot, but he was Cowboys quarterback, so he got a ton of attention, right? But um, yeah, Tony's awesome. I always felt like when he was calling the plays in hurry up O, that they the team was the most successful. There's some truth to that. A lot of truth, actually. Because we always made, we'd always make it to the end zone with him. Right. He'd always make it to a touchdown. And so he's a great play caller, which you see play oh, calling yeah. now, not play calling, but um, broadcasting on, right, on, on TV CBS, now, yeah. right? And so, man, if you give, that would have been, uh, I, I don't know if they ever did it after I left, but that would have been cool experiment to see what kind of game calling he could have been on the field. Right. You know? And does your tainted nutsack miss his hands? Oh, hand? stop. <laughs> does sometimes your stop, nutsack go, stop, oh, I miss stop. Tony Romo's hands? Stop. Nobody call, he calls me asking once a <laughs> <laughs> What is he asking? <laughs> <laughs> I missed uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> another wonderful conversation. We love you guys so much. And we love that you're Thanks, part of y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I know me and Corey took over the conversation. And That's I, all right. I apologize for that. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please reach out um, and let us know how you felt about the episode and our friends. And uh, continue to follow, like, and share. Anything else? No, thank you all for joining. Yes, yes. All right, that was, was a good awesome. one. Awesome. Yeah.